I want to get right into the Word of God. Um, I'm going to share with you tonight out of the newest book that released last year called The Awe of God. Um, man, is it, it's, it's blown me away. No book I've ever written in my life, including The Bait of Satan, came out of the blocks like this one has. Um, it's still exploding, and it, the publishers and I are just shaking our heads going, what is God doing here? So it's obviously a message that's resonating with people. Um, and so tonight I want to share with you on it. I, I just really feel in my heart, and I want to get your expectation up. We're going to experience the presence of God in here tonight in a very... We already are. Don't get me wrong, but I really believe that a lot of you are going to experience the presence of God in here tonight in a way like you've never experienced before. So I, I want you to believe for it. How many of you believe that one service can change your life forever? Come on, I really believe that. Amen? And so um, I would love to introduce my beautiful family to you, but I don't feel to do that. Lisa will do that Sunday morning. I cannot wait to hear Lisa Bevere Sunday morning. You are my favorite preacher on the planet. She, we were preaching together in Maui just Sunday night. Oh, my gosh. We've been uh, in Maui Sunday night, Louisiana. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy this month. Anyway, but I'm so excited to hear you can introduce our family on Sunday morning. So y'all come back so you can meet my family on Sunday morning because my family, I love them so, so, so much. We've got so many G-babies now. It's amazing, okay? And I'm telling you, they all got me. Oh, man, do they have me. Now I know why God loves his kids so much. I mean, it's go it goes glory to glory is what happens, okay? Kids are glory. Grandkids are glory to glory. Amen. So anyway, guys, let's just believe that God speaks to us tonight. Amen. So let's lift up our hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come here tonight, first and foremost, Lord God, to say thank you. Lord, you chose us, which is overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming to me. I, it absolutely brings me to my knees every time I think about it, Father, that you chose us and that you not only chose us, but you chose to make us sons and daughters. And so tonight I'm asking, dear Father, that you would send your spirit that he would manifest in this building in a way like we've never experienced him before. I'm asking that he would do what he loves to do the most, and that is glorify and honor Jesus in a way like we have never seen him before. And as you do this, Lord God, may we go from glory to glory and from faith to faith. For I decree this night your kingdom has come. Your will shall be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven. And for this, we give you all the glory, yes. the honor, and the praise, and the thanksgiving. And it is in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, majestic, holy, awesome, magnificent name we pray. And everybody that agrees, shouts! Yeah. Come on, give him praise. Give him praise. Amen. 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 You can be seated. I'm going to open up tonight with something that it may kind of take you back a bit. But believe me, we're going, we're, going, we're going positive. But this one, you may go, wait a minute. But I discovered something last year that sent me on a quest. And uh, Barna had done a massive, massive study that came out, I believe, in 2020 or 2021. But what they discovered that is in the past 23 years, over 20 million Americans have walked away from the faith. Now, I'm talking about Americans that were attending church regularly, praying regularly, and now they are professing atheists, agnostics, and spiritualists. They're not just quiet. They are actually professing. I have a pastor friend who has par uh, a couple in his church. They just came up, and they said, we had three sons. All three sons were called to ministry. Wow. Yet they went to university. They all three came back as agnostics. Wow. What is going on in this nation? Why are we losing so many people? This has been what I have been crying out, saying, God, what's going on? Because 20 million people is one out of every 14 Americans. Wow. And Paul the Apostle made this statement. He said, hey, he said, that day will not come until there is a great falling away. Right. Okay? But what Paul never wrote is that they wouldn't come back. Yeah, yeah, right. And just as John the Baptist was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah, to call the lost sheep of the house of Israel back to the house of God. I believe that there is a group of men and women that are going to go and they're going to call back the lost in the church back to the house of God. Amen. Amen. So I had to ask, I said, God, why have people left? And I really believe the answer is because they never experienced the true, authentic presence of God. I believe this with all my heart. You see, the presence of God is a very real, very real part of Christianity. Jesus made a statement. He said, I will manifest myself to you. 
What does the word manifest mean? It means to bring from the unseen into the realm of the seen, the unknown into the realm of the known, the unheard into the realm of the heard. It is when God reveals himself to our senses. It means to reveal openly. It means to disclose. It means to bring to the light. It, to put it in one simple terminology, it is God's tangible presence yes. where you experience him. And Moses made a statement. He said, it is your presence that separates me and your people from all the other people that are on the planet. And we also know this, that the presence, uh, that the joy of the Lord is, well, I should say, we know that in his presence is fullness of joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. So the reason people are leaving is because they're not having strength, because they're not experiencing the genuine presence of God. So that leads us to the next question. Why are Christians not experiencing the presence of God? I believe with all my heart, there's one answer. It's because we're not chasing after and pursuing holiness. Let me say it one more time. I believe it's because we're not chasing after holiness. Now, we got a problem here. Because with this word, it strikes a lot of fear in people. All right? Why? Because, well... There have been preachers, pastors, ministers in the past who these people didn't even, they didn't, they, they, these leaders didn't even like people. Okay? Can, can I say this? If, 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 if you teach the Bible, you better like people. Okay? If you don't like people and you're teaching the Bible, you're in the wrong place. You should be teaching physics. Okay? Not the Bible. But what these guys did is they beat us up with their rules and regulations because they wanted to control our behavior, right? Now, there are other people that look at holiness and they go, no, 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 no. That that, that will give me a very dull and boring life. But I love what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis says this, how little people know who think that holiness is dull. When one meets the real thing, it's irresistible. So what I want to do tonight... Is I'm going to talk about the irresistible. Can we do that? Amen? Now, we have a situation, okay? And and that is this. Um, Because people are so down on holiness, so scared by the word, so scared by any preaching of it, it literally caused a problem with some teachers, some ministers. Because what they said is, man, it's all over the Bible. And it is. You can't avoid it. So what they did is they did something. They began to tell us, don't worry about holiness because Jesus is our holiness. So you don't have to be concerned about how you live. Don't even think about that. He is our holiness. Now, the thing that makes this complex is they're right, but yet it's not the full picture. Because what they did is they lumped all holiness into one bucket. And that is positional holiness. You say, what do you mean positional holiness? All right, let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 1. And there are so many scriptures in the New Testament, but I'm just going to show you one. Paul makes the statement, he says, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now, before the foundation of the world, the Father and the Son had a conversation We're going to create man. They're going to mess up. It's going to separate them from us. But we love them so much. We want to bring them back. So would you be willing to go die for them? Son goes, sure, I'll do it. All right? So that's why he's called the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So God makes up his mind at the beginning of creation. Before, excuse me, before the beginning of creation. These people are going to be saved and sanctified or declared holy because of what Jesus did for them. You got it? So let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you another example to help you illustrate, all right? Because, you know, God's always using marriage imagery in the Bible, right? In the Old Testament, he's our hu- husband, right? Yeah. If you look at the New Testament, it said a man leaves a father and mother, be joined to the wife, right? Yeah. Two should become one. This is actually an illustration of the way Jesus and the church are one. So 42 years ago, this October 2nd, in Lafayette, Indiana, at Covenant Presbyterian Church, Lisa Descano walked down the aisle in a white dress, Okay, and on that very day, she became my wife. Now, let me say this. She is not more my wife today, positionally, 
than she was the day I married her. Got it? And she's not going to be more my wife 80 years from now than the day I married her. She became my wife, settled, done. That's positional holiness. All right? But now let me say this. Before Lisa married me, you know, she flirted with guys. Guys asked her out on dates, and she would go on dates with them. She would talk with other guys on the phone and, and, and flirt with them a little, right? You know, it's all right, right? She'd go out to restaurants and eat with guys. But after we got married, she stopped giving guys her phone number. Oh, wow. She stopped going out on dates with other guys. She now had a behavior that was in line with her position. Okay? So that's called positional holiness. Are you with me? So here's an example. Peter writes, oh, excuse me, that's called behavioral holiness. Peter writes, live as children of obedience to God. Do not conform yourselves to the evil desires that governed you in your former ignorance when you did not know the requirements of the gospel. Wow, this is strong. But as the one who called you is holy, you yourselves also be holy in all your conduct and manner of living. And other translations say in your behavior. So now you see there is a behavior that lines up with our position. If you look at the definition of holiness in the complete word study dictionary, you'll see this. It's got these two definitions, dedicated or separated unto God. That's position. And the resultant state, this is part of the definition of holiness, is a behavior befitting the separation. That's behavioral. Are you with me? Now, uh, okay, so what, let me, let, let, let me go there. Let me, let, me, let me go here. What does now holiness have to do with God's presence? That's what we got to ask ourselves. What does it have to do? Why are you bringing this up? Because you said the reason people are leaving is because they're not experiencing the presence of God. Right? Yeah. So what does holiness have to do with the presence of God? A lot. Because look at Hebrews 12, 14. It says, pursue holiness without which no one is seeing the Lord. Now, there's so much here. First of all, let's deal with pursue. What does the word pursue there mean? It means chase after with the intent to apprehend. It speaks of intensity. It speaks of urgency. Okay? Now, we got to ask the question. Is he talking about behavioral holiness or positional holiness? Well, Lisa, you go to a Bible study, a woman's Bible study on Wednesday morning. I'm sure you all go around the circle during your Bible study and you say, hey, what's the prayer request? Can you imagine, Lisa, going to that Bible study and going, girls, my number one prayer request this week. I'm just pursuing being John Bevere's wife. I want to be John Bevere's wife so much. Would you please pray that I'd be John Bevere's wife? They'd all laugh at her. I said, Lisa, you became John Bevere's wife 42 years ago. You're never going to be more John Bevere's wife. But now if she went to that Bible study and she said, girls, I, I just want to have the behavior, the conduct of a godly wife for John Bevere. Now that's a prayer request. And that makes sense. So we know right away, he's not talking about positional holiness. He's talking about behavioral holiness. So now listen to this. Chase after with the intent to apprehend holiness. Why? Because without it, no one's going to see the Lord. Now hold on a minute. See the Lord? A lot of people don't get this. Let me make a statement. Revelations 1-7 makes a statement. But behold, he comes in the clouds. And every eye shall see him. Even those who pierced him. Every person is going to see God at the judgment seat. So what's he talking about? Well, in the first 50 years of my life, I think I had 12 United States presidents that governed my life. Okay? Their decisions affected me. The laws they, or the decrees they made affected what I did. How I handled my money. A lot of aspects of life. But you know that 50 years, I never, ever saw a United States president. In other words, I was never in the presence of a United States president. Now, those presidents had friends that they saw on a daily basis. They had people they worked with that were in their presence and saw them 
on a daily basis. I never saw a United States president. Well, there are Christians. They are under the lordship of Jesus. They are affected by his decisions, by his word, by his governance. But they're not in his presence. They're not seeing him. Why? Because they're not chasing with the intent to apprehend holiness. Are you seeing this? Now, I'm going to prove to you this is what, this is exactly what it's saying. Because let's go back to Jesus' full statement here in John 14, 21. The person who has my commands. Stop right there. Commands? Yes, commands. Do you know there's over 500 commands in the New Testament? Okay, now, stop. Stop right there before you check out. The Old Testament had about over 500 commands as well. Those commands were to earn a relationship with God. God was proving to man, you can never be good enough and keep my commands and earn a relationship with me. Okay? The New Testament, the commands are for enhancing our relationship. Not to develop our relationship. Your relationship with God is a gift. Old Testament proved you can never earn it. You can never be good enough. But in the New Testament, he says, I want to show you how to enhance your relationship with me. Okay? Now, here's the problem with the teaching. When people say, oh, don't worry about holiness. Just don't think about it. You know, Jesus is your holiness. And so these people are committing adultery of the world. Because James makes a statement. He says, my brethren, 15 times in his book. So he's not talking to unbelievers. He said, you're seeking a friendship with the world? You're committing adultery against God. He calls them adulterers. Now, I have a marriage certificate. I was given that marriage certificate on the day I married Lisa. It's from the state of Indiana. says we are married. Can you imagine me holding that marriage certificate up? And saying, hey, we're married while I'm committing adultery with other girls. Okay? I don't think it would last very long. But what would happen? What would happen? Okay, now wait a minute. I may still technically be married to her. But why don't I commit adultery against her? Why has it been 42 years and I'm not going to? There's actually a real, real important reason I don't commit adultery against her. Okay, let me give you the first two obvious ones, but I'm going to give you the, the real motivator, okay? Number one, I fear God. Number two, Lisa is a sharpshooter, and she told me she would make it painless. And I, I just so happen to believe her, okay? She just said, John, you'd be on the 10th hole of the golf course, and you'd be gone. And I watched her take down a 14-point buck, literally drop him in, her tra- in his tracks. I didn't watch it, but I heard about it, okay? All right? So I watched her put a, bu- a bullet in a bullseye that big from 115 yards. She is a sharpshooter, okay? So let's, let's put those two reasons aside. Can I tell you? Can, can I? I knew I, knew I was going to have preaching from the front row tonight. Because I didn't start preaching on this until about a month ago. So... Um, I'm going to tell you the real reason why I don't commit adultery against Lisa Bevere. Because I never, ever, ever want to lose those moments when her head's on the pillow next to me and she starts sharing the intimate things of her heart that she wouldn't share with anybody else. I never, ever, ever want to lose that. That is more valuable to me than anything. The fact that this beautiful, amazing, godly woman shares her heart with me and tells me things she she wouldn't tell anybody else, I'd lose it all because I could hold that certificate up and say, hey, I'm married. I guarantee you she's not going to share the secrets of her heart. So having the behavior of a godly husband to Lisa enhances my intimacy. Do you want to know why I, won't, I, I don't want to commit adultery against Jesus? He said, commit adultery? Yes. James said, you seek a friendship with the world. You are an adulterer. Okay? You have made yourself an ought with God. If I go out and commit adultery with girls, I got news for you. She's going to close up her heart, and she's not going to share things with me. 
I'm going to lose that privilege. I go out and jump in bed with the world, and you know what I lose? I lose that intimacy where God speaks. Hold on. Let me say it. Where God speaks something in my heart that I have never known or heard before. That I never want to lose. People ask me, they say, where did 24 books come from? That. That's where it comes from. I never want to lose that. You say, well, I, 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 I really hardly ever experienced that. Well, perhaps maybe you should check into your behavior. Does it align with your position? You still with me? So this is, you ever stop and think about it? The person who has my commands, let's stop and think about this. Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do everything I commanded you. Do you know Jesus made a statement? He said, you are my friends. If it's conditional. If means if you don't fulfill the condition, you don't get this. If you do whatever I command you. I mean, I could rip off commands in the New Testament right now. Those commands aren't for you to be saved. You could never, ever, ever keep the word of God and be saved. You had to have a regeneration. You had to be changed inside. You had to have that. But now God is saying, you want to be intimate with me? Just like, I want to be intimate with her. So I'm like, I'm staying away from all that stuff because I I don't want to lose this. So the person who has my, here we are, John 14, 21. The person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me, and I will love him and show, reveal, manifest myself to him. Now, look at this. I will let myself be clearly seen. Remember, pursue holiness without which no man will see the Lord. I will be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him. Let me tell you something. When Jesus is made real to you, you don't walk away. You can take my head off. Go ahead. Take it off. Because my life is in God. My joy is in God. I'm here. I'm here. Listen, I'm praying this morning in the hotel room. I'm just going to tell you a little bit of my intimate prayer time. I was praying. I said, God, really the only reason I live is to be with you. I want to be with you. I want to be in your throne room. I want to be in your presence. The only reason I'm here is because I love my family a lot, and I know I'm supposed to take care of them, and because you've called me to do a work. Other than that, I would much rather be with you. I yearn to be with him. I groan to be with him. And, and, and somebody who is not in his tangible presence, you don't have intimacy with him, you look at that and go, that's weird. Was it weird when you fell in love with your girlfriend? Was it weird when you thought about her day and night? Was it weird when you wanted to be with her more than you wanted to do anything? It was, it, was, it was weird when you were seven years old and you watch your older brother do it and you're like, oh, this is ridiculous. But then when you experience it, all of a sudden now, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Still with me? Now, God makes a statement that I think gets overlooked so much. I think this gets so easily overlooked. Second Corinthians, Paul writes it, 616. It says, as God says... I will live in them (laughs) and walk among them. Okay. Are you grabbing what's happening here? Okay. Who is this talking? This is, okay. This, this is not some really popular person. This is not even a big angel. This is God almighty. You know, the problem is, is we have lost the awe of who he is. I, re- I remember, you know, you know, Lisa and I have four boys and they're four of the greatest young men I know on the planet. I remember when they were about ages 12 down to four, there was a certain NBA player that we were just hearing about too much around the house. Okay. He's the greatest basketball player of all time. No doubt about it. I admit it. Okay. But I mean, 
I mean, I'm hearing him, Michael this, Michael that, Michael this, Michael that. There's posters of Michael, and, and, and I'm getting a little Michaeled out. And, and it, to be honest with you, I've got, I, I knew, like I said, he's a great basketball player, but it was out of place with these kids. All I'm hearing about from them, their friends, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan. I'm like, oh, my gosh. It was really, it was really grating on me. So I remember a church asked us to come preach on the East Coast of the United States. And what they did is they put, because my whole family was coming, they put us on, in a hotel right on the beach. I remember the, the, the Atlantic Ocean was really stirred up that day, really stirred up that day. And I remember they were body surfing, and they were getting slammed and sand in their suits, their mouth, their bed, they're laughing, and they were like, oh, my God, that was great, tumbling in those ways. And so they all come up in the room. They all get their towels around them, and I thought, this is, the, this is it. This is it. This is the time to do it. So I opened up the sliding door so you can hear the pounding ocean, right? And I, I set them on the bed, and they're all looking at us. I said, time for a dad talk, guys, Okay. And so um, I looked at them and said, hey, guys, that's a pretty powerful ocean out there, isn't it? They go, oh, yeah, after they'd been thrown by it, right? I said, yeah. I said, pretty big ocean too, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I said, you know, you can only see one mile out there. That thing goes another 4,000 miles. I said, there's another one on the other side called Pacific. It's even bigger. And I said, there's two others beside that. I said, boys, do you know that God weighed every drop of that water in the palm of his hands? And I said, and you're impressed with a guy that can jump from the 15-foot line and put a little ball through a hole? He went, oh, whoa. Then I started telling about the universe because it declares his awesomeness, his glory, right? And let me tell you something. They still enjoyed Michael Jordan, which they should because he's talented. He's got a gift. But he came back into perspective. You see, with social media today, with all this being plastered, okay, the guru, the, the guru businessmen, the beautiful Hollywood actresses and handsome actors and, 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 and the talented athletes and the, and the gifted musicians, I mean, you just keep getting it. You know what? What's happening is God in Isaiah 45 verse 15 says, God, you are God that hides yourself. He's hidden his glory to see what is going to what we're going to give our awe to. Yeah. And we're going to give awe to the temperate, to, to that, which, that which does have glory, yet nothing compared to him. You know, I look, I look, I look, okay, let's just talk about him. Okay, Isaiah is this godly preacher. He's the most godly man in all of Israel, right? And he's preaching in Isaiah 5. Woe to the drunkard. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to, the, to, to, to those who lie. And then he comes to Isaiah 6, and God says, hey, boy, I'm going to bring you up to my throne room. And he brings him, must transport him in the spirit, brings him up and plots him right in front of the throne of God. First thing he notices is these massive angels, right? And one is crying to the other, okay? Holy! Now, now, I got news for you. It says, holy, 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 and we made a hymn out of it, and people yawn when they sing it. They're not singing a song making God feel good about himself. They are responding to what they see. Every moment, another facet of his glory is revealed, and one cries the other, holy! You see, it says holy three times. Yeah, that's a Hebrew form of writing. Whenever the Hebrews want to emphasize a word, they write it twice. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus doesn't have a speech impediment. If you're John sitting there, Jesus goes, verily, I say unto you guys. Or he goes, oh, man, i got to write that twice. Not everybody says to me, Lord. He writes it, Lord, Lord, right? Okay, now Hebrews are really careful with words. Very much unlike us. Like three years ago, the big word was awesome. Everything's awesome, awesome, awesome. It was so irritating me, right? I'm like... You know, oh, that movie was so awesome and this and that. And you're just like, oh, my gosh. Do you know the only time you find the word awesome in the Bible is when it relates to God yeah. or his attributes? Yeah. Listen to the word awesome, full of awe. Yeah. Right? So I, as a man of God, stand up and say, God is awesome. And you go, yes, yeah, so was my burger yesterday. And you're like, okay, I, the, you know, the enemy wants to destroy language. So the Hebrews, the Hebrews, were, so, the Hebrews were so careful with language, right? So, for a Hebrew writer to write something to the third degree of succession yeah. wow. means you cannot emphasize that word anymore. Yeah. Wow. You find it very rarely in the Bible. In other words, when the angels are, remember before the bowls, the final bowls of judgment, they go, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the left. Yeah. They're not saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. They're saying, whoa, so loud. They're probably shaking all of the heavens. Yeah. Okay? And so, John, the apostle, writes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, not only Isaiah, but John the Apostle, when he sees the throne of God, sees these angels crying, holy. Yeah. 
And they're crying it so loud. They're shaking an arena that seats over a billion beings to its foundations. Look at it. I think I've got, yeah, they shook the entire temple to its foundations. Okay. Now, when John sees the Lord, he can go, dude, there he is. Whoa. I finally meet a man upstairs. It's good to finally meet you. You, you, know, you know what this godly man does? He literally collapses, falls on his face, grovels on the floor, and cries out. Now cries out, woe is me. Yeah. It's no longer woe is the sinner. It's now woe is me. Why does he cry out woe is me? Because for the first time in his life, he has a realization of who this God he is that he's serving. And for the first time in his life, he realizes who he is before this holy God. Are you, seri- are, are, are you seeing this? If you look at Job, Job, God is the one that said, there is no one more righteous on the whole planet. There's no one that lives a more godly life than Job. And yet Job makes this statement. He says, God, I have heard you by the hearing of the ear. Now my eye sees you. I abhor myself. He realizes who he is. See, he had heard about it, heard about it in church, heard about it in church. But now he sees, I abhor myself. If you, if, if you look at Moses, Moses, so close to God, most godly man in his generation. He said, when God came down the mountain, he said, so terrifying was the sight of God that I was exceedingly fearful and trembling. And he was the one that was close. If you look at John the apostle, the closest disciple to Jesus, right? He sees Jesus in his glory on the deserted island of Patmos. He said, when I saw him, I fell down like a dead man. This is who we're serving. And you see, he hides himself to see what? Are we, are we going to be enamored by everything we're seeing on social media? On mainstream media? Because you know the glory, the greatness of God is... We have this treasure in earth and vessels. It's revealed in the face of Christ Jesus. And why is it so important that we do get in his presence and behold him in our hearts? Because we're changed from glory to glory as we behold him. Amen. Okay, so let's go back to 2 Corinthians. As God has said, with that in mind, as God has said, I will live in them. Does that mean a little more after what I just shared with you? I will live in them, in you. Oh my God. And I'll walk among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. And I will be your father and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. There's seven promises there, right? I numbered them, right? Did you see it? Right? Oh, I, 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 get, get, let him, let him see it. Yeah, there it is. Here's, there, there, there it is. All right. Now, you're in the right place. Good. Stay there. Here's the next verse, but it's the next chapter. This is why a lot of people miss this. Because we have these promises, the seven promises, I'll live in them, walk among them, be their God. They should be my people. They'd be my sons and daughters. Right? Beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from some filthiness all of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the love of God. Oh, fear of God. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, let's just, we got to walk through this. Just, just, just take a two, let's just take a few moments here in camp. Let us cleanse ourselves. Notice he doesn't say the blood of Jesus will cleanse us. Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you telling me the blood of Jesus doesn't cleanse me? No, I'd never, ever, ever in a million years tell you that. What I am saying is don't you confuse the work of justification with the work of sanctification. Whoa, those are two big words. I don't get them. Justification, the moment, the day, the moment you received Jesus Christ as your Lord, you were cleansed from all. you, You became white as snow. You were cleansed from all unrighteousness. But at that moment, the work of sanctification begins, and that's what's done on the inside of you, works its way to the outside where people can see it. It's your behavior. That's the work of sanctification or the work of holiness, and that you have to cooperate with. Now, notice he says flesh and spirit. Let's let's do the obvious one, okay? Why aren't we addressing more things today? I sometimes think that we're going to give an account as a nation. Not for what we're saying, but what we're not saying. You know, Paul said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men. 
What made you innocent in the blood of all men? He actually says in the NLT, if anybody suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. Why? Because I didn't hold back what was needful. I didn't hold back the whole counsel of God. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians. Let's just, let's just make this clear. God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. That means porn on the internet. Now, I'm not throwing stones. I was bound to pornography from the age of 11 to 25. And six years as a Christian and in ministry, I'm bound to pornography. And it was a battle to get free. And I'm telling you, it took the grace of God and, 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 and me crying out and saying, God, I need you. Yeah. On a four-day fast, on May the 6th, 1985, I got totally, completely set free from pornography. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm on a radio program, and, and, and this is a live radio program in Minneapolis, I believe it was, and this is years ago. And, and I'm talking about the fact that Jesus said, man, there's going to be people who say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, I don't know who you are. You call me Lord, but I don't know who you are because you practice lawlessness. Right? You practice disobeying me, right? And, and the guy goes, come on. He got mad. He got really mad. He goes, come on. You telling me somebody's really struggling with pornography? You telling me that, that you know, well, he didn't even say struggling. You tell, somebody's looking at pornography and, you know, they just, they got needs, man. He was like on and on. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can, can we just time out a minute here? Can I make sure I understand what you're saying to me? I said, what you're telling me is the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to get me free from the penalty of sin, but it's just not powerful enough to get me free from the bondage of sin. Is that what you're saying? And he went really quiet. I said, you can't say that to me, sir, because about 10 years ago, I got free from pornography and I'm still free today. You would be amazed at how many people I, I meet. They go, I'm Christian. I'm born again. And, you know, my, my, my girlfriend and I are living together until we get married. I'm like, wait a minute. You just put those two, two things in the same sentence? Yeah. Did you ever read Hebrews 13.3? 13, the marriage bed is undefiled, but those that have sex before marriage and those who commit adultery, God will judge? Well, do you think you're exempt? Wow. Wow. Wait, but this is hate speech. Okay. Somebody walks, hold on. Oh. Hold on, hold on. Okay, we're, we're, up on an Arctic, we're up on an Arctic cruise. And there's an island at two miles away. And the water's 32 degrees. And you go, you know what? I'm going to go swim two miles of that, that island over there. And I go, it is impossible for a human being to live more than 45 minutes in 33 degree temperature of water. Now, is that hate speech? Or is that me trying to save the guy's life? I'm like, is it hate speech that I don't ever want to see you come under judgment? I don't ever want you to be deceived and not, look, look, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want you, worst of all, I don't want you not experiencing the intimacy and the presence of God. So now you get discouraged and you walk away from the faith. And you're another statistic. So that's hate speech because I'm telling you that? You say, you're pretty passionate right now. Yes, I'm really passionate about this. Because you have to understand, I'm a dad, okay? I'm a dad. I, I really feel like I'm a father now in the faith. I'm 65 this year. I feel like I'm, I'm becoming a father, okay? I'm really upset about these kids walking away. I'm really upset about people falling away. And I'm like, they're falling away because we're not telling the truth up front. So they're, 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 they're it's like, they're jumping off the boat going, I'm going to swim two miles over to the island. I'm like, no, don't do it. Amen. Amen. It's, a, it's amazing you preach this in Southern California. Amen. <laughs> Amen. David said, I'll be careful to live a blameless life. I will live a life of integrity in my own home. I will refuse to look at anything work, worthless or wicked. Can, can we live by that? That's David. He didn't even have the grace of God to empower him to do it. Paul made the statement, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols, who commit adultery, or practice homosexuality, or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or abusive, or cheap people, none of these are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Don't. 
fool yourself. In other words, it's one thing to deceive somebody. It's a whole nother animal to deceive yourself. And that's what Paul's saying. Don't deceive yourself. You still with me? Okay, but that's not even the big one. The one I really want to kind of look at is the filthiness of the spirit. That's our inner person. That's our thoughts, motives, and intentions. Paul makes a statement. He says, our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our heart. What is Paul saying there? Who you desire to please is what drives your motives. You want to please man? Your motives are going to be motivated to impress man. You want to please God? You don't care what people think. But you love them deeply. You love them deeply. Ananias and Sapphira. Here's a couple in the Bible. They go to church. They're members of the church in Jerusalem. They're probably the biggest givers in the church. Because a lot of people don't understand this. If you look at Ananias and Sapphira, it starts out with the word but. Acts 5 verse 1 starts out with the word but. As an author that's written 24 books, I have never started one chapter with the word but. This is one long letter, okay? All right. The reason people don't understand this is they don't read the previous verse, which is in chapter 4. Because in the previous verse, you got this guy named Barnabas who's from the country of Cyprus, okay? And he sells his land in Cyprus and brings it and puts it at Peter's feet. Now, I'm going to modernize this. If you own land in Cyprus, it's like owning land in Newport Beach. Okay? You're really, really wealthy compared to everybody else. So this guy probably, let's, let's modernize it. He makes $5 million off the sale, brings it, puts it at Peter's feet. The whole church sees it. Now, the very next verse says, but a man named Ananias and Sapphira. Well, they're probably the biggest givers. Now, gifts should be, we give attention to gifts. I, th- I think we're a little weird about giving, but if you look at preaching, it gets attention. Serving gets attention. Hospitality gets attention. I mean, I go, I, I rave over some of these churches, the hospitality people that they have, the way they serve. I mean, I'm just like, I look at Philip, he picks us up, and he and his beautiful wife, Tan, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, th- these guys are amazing, right? I celebrate their gift. Do you know we should celebrate the gift of giving? Why, why are we so weird about it? It's, it's, it's stupid. It, it's actually a spiritual gift that's listed in Romans. So you know what they did? They put the money openly at Peter's feet so the whole church could praise God. So Barnabas puts five million in front of the whole church and everybody goes, whoa! And in essence, fire, they're insecure. Because why? They haven't, they haven't cleansed the filthiness of the inward man. It probably didn't start out this way. It probably started out they were in leadership and you know, it's, you know, they started getting in this marriage fight and they show up to church like, oh, babe, I just love her, right? You follow me? Social media, fix your vacation. Love doing life with this girl. <laughs> but they're fighting at home. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, now, now, you know, wait a minute. You got, you got to understand something. Let, let's get this a little clearer. To really get this, you got to understand, you got three images. Everybody say, I got three images. Got three images. You got your perceived image. What's your perceived image? That's the way people perceive you. You got your projected image. That's the way you want people to see you. And you have your actual image. That's the way God sees you. And that is what will be revealed at the judgment seat. Okay? Now, if you look at Jesus, his perceived image wasn't that great with a lot of people. They thought he was a wine bibber, a glutton. They thought he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. They thought he was, you know, casting out demons by Beelzebub. I mean, it wasn't good with a lot of people. But his actual image, God said, this is my son and I am well pleased, right? Okay, so Ananias and Sapphira are all about their projected image. It probably grew on social media. It trained them. As they were doing it, you know, showing everybody, oh, my kids, the kids are rebellious little brats. And they're like, we're just having a family vacay. We're just loving each other. And yet, you know, they're, they're acting like hellions, right? And so now, you know, they're really enjoying the attention everybody's giving them for giving these big gifts. This guy drops $5 million at Peter's feet, and let's go sell the big plot. So they sell the big plot for $8 million. It's way too much to give that. But we want to appear... Go back. Go to that scripture. We want to appear. Appear. In other words, we want to project. Right? Is that it? Okay, anyway. So, so, so let's make this really clear. Bringing the offering wasn't a sin. Their actions were perfect. Except for their words. 
What motivated their words was they wanted to project an image of being big givers and get the attention back. Now, the glory of God was so strong. Let me tell you, Peter walked out of that meeting and they laid the sick in the streets and just his shadow, they're getting up. See, there's been a lot of preachers lied to since then and people haven't fallen over dead. That's because the greater the glory, the greater the judgment. I should say the greater the glory, the swifter the judgment. No judgment is not denied judgment. It's just delayed. Remember, remember what Paul said, Timothy? Some men's sins are clearly evident. Ananias and Sapphira, it was clearly evident. But other sins of other men fall later, precede them to judgment, to the judgment seat. This couple falls over dead. And you know what the Bible says? Let's look at it. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Look at the next verse. It says, great fear gripped the entire church. The word great is the Greek word megas, which we get our word mega fear, mega from. Mega fear gripped the church, not the unbelievers. The church said, wait a minute, he's not a sugar daddy like we thought he was. See, this is, this is the thing that we've got to remember. You've got this narrow road that Jesus talks about. And this narrow road's got two ditches on it. First ditch is called legalism. God revealed something to the church when we were really bad in this legalism. And that was the Jesus revolution that God is a good God and our daddy loves us. And you know what that love did? It delivered us out of the ditch of legalism. But we went to the other side of the road and we fell into the other ditch and that's called lawlessness. And you know what keeps us out of that ditch? The holy fear of God. It's by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. That's why Paul goes on, and I'll close here. That's why Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, because we have these promises of God dwelling in us in his glory. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, not in the love of God. I'm in a federal penitentiary in 1994 with one of the most famous human beings on the planet, but for all the wrong reasons. This man had the largest ministry in the world in 1980s, the largest ministry. But he was really famous because CNN covered his trial every single night. Lisa and I, as a young married couple, watched his trial every single night. He was sentenced to 45 years. It got reduced to five years. He's in the federal penitentiary. He gets a hold of the first book that we wrote, Victory in the Wilderness. He reads it. He calls his assistant. His assistant calls our assistant. Would John come and visit me in prison? I said, sure. I'll never forget walking into that prison. He comes in with all the, the garb, the prison garb. This is in his fourth year. He grabs me, holds me, won't let me go. He's like 20 years older than me. He grabs and holds me, holds me, holds me. I'd never met this man. And yet I, I, this is the faint, most well-known man on the planet. He's holding me, holding me, holding me. He said, we have so much to talk about and we only have 90 minutes. So he sits me down and looks at me and he says, first thing is out, out of his mouth is, this prison is not God's judgment on my life. It's his mercy. And he looked at me and he said, if I continued living the way I was living, I would have ended up separated from God forever and in hell forever. I thought, oh my gosh. So he proceeds to tell me a story, how Jesus delivered him from all the wickedness. And he said, John, there was a lot of wickedness his first year of prison. They had a, a men's group in the prison. They spend three hours a day in the Bible, three hours in the gospels mostly. I said, you're leading it, right? He goes, no way. I'm a master manipulator. I'm not touching that. I'm letting somebody else lead it. So when we got to the point, here I am a young preacher. I'm in my, I'm in my uh, mid thirties and I had a question and my biggest question I wanted to ask. So when he was done with the whole story, I said, here's my question. When did you fall out of love with Jesus? I watched you weep as you preach. I watched you weep when souls got saved. When did you fall out of love with Jesus? He looked at me and said, John, I didn't. Now my walls go up. I'm like, okay, he's phony again. 
And I said, I said, so I challenged him. I said, what do you mean you didn't fall out of love with Jesus? Come on. You committed adultery, and I named the woman in 1983. You did all this mail fraud you talked about those next seven years. You said you got this wickedness cast out of you. What do you mean you didn't fall out of love with Jesus? He said, John, I loved him all the way through it. And he saw the confusion on my face, and he said, I didn't fear God. I went, what? He said, there's millions of Americans like me. They love Jesus, but they have no fear of God. Now look at Psalm 25, 14. Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. Let's go back. With them, he shares his secrets. Let's go back to what we said. Why well, don't I want to commit adultery against Lisa? I don't want to lose her telling me the secrets of her heart. Why don't I want to commit adultery against God? Because I don't want him not to whisper those secrets in my heart. I don't want him to stop opening up his word like he does. God shares the secrets with his intimate close friends, and his intimate close friends are those who fear him. I'm looking at one of the most famous ministers on the planet at the time who loved Jesus. But he lost his intimacy because he lost his holy fear. Somewhere along the line. Fear of God is not to be scared of God because you can't be intimate with somebody you're afraid of. It's actually being more terrified of being away from him. Moses said, God's come to see if his fear is in you. He said, don't be afraid because God's come to see if his fear is in you. He's not contradicting himself. He's saying, don't be scared of God. Nobody loves you more in the entire universe. He said, but you need to have an awe of God. Oswald Chambers makes this, and this is the last statement I'm making tonight before I pray. Oswald Chambers makes this statement. I've got to go back because it was much earlier. I, I, I don't know where. Let's see. I want, I want to read this to you. When we preach the love of God, there is a danger of forgetting that the Bible reveals not the first, the love of God, but the intense, blazing holiness of God with his love at the center of that holiness. Here's the deal. God is not asking any more of you than what a spouse would ask. Just give me your heart. Just give me your heart. And here's what causes my heart to grieve. And this is what I'm going to call for in a minute. I want, you to, I want you to get an image of this, okay? Here's a young man named Matt. And he gets down on one knee with his girlfriend, right? His girlfriend's Brenda. And Matt has this little box and he opens up. Brenda, would you be my wife? And she squeals with excitement. Yes, I will be your wife. And she jumps up and down, hugs him. So, oh, Matt, this is going to be a wonderful life. But you know, I, I did, did date Aaron for two years in high school. I'd like a couple nights with him a year. And I can't forget my college sweetheart. My college sweetheart, oh, my college sweetheart, Sam. I need a couple nights with him a year but I will love you so much more than Sam, so much more than Aaron. We'll be together 360 nights a year. You'll be my favorite. <laughs> Is there any young man on the planet in America that would say yes? There's not one. All right, now I look at our bridegroom. Jesus, he chose to come into this earth. A cursed world. He leaves what we can't even only imagine right now. And he comes into this cursed world knowing he's going to be mocked, spit on, lied about, insulted. He's going to be punched in the mouth <clears throat> several times, have his beard plucked out, thorns shoved into his head. He's going to be whipped with lead tip whips that's going to rip his flesh. He knows this. And by the time they get him to count to the cross. He's going to be so beat up. He's not even going to look like a human being anymore. Isaiah prophesied it. Isaiah 52 said he didn't even have the appearance of a human being any longer. Our 
creator comes to this earth knowing this because he's giving his entire life for his bride, for you. Do we think he's going to return for a bride that says, let me jump in bed with pornography a few nights a year? God, I got needs. Let, let me sleep with this girl over here. I know she's not my wife, but I got needs. In other words, us belligerently violating <clears throat> what he died to set us free from and flirting with it and giving it our number. You can't tell me you believe that. He's coming back for a bride that's given herself to him the way he gave himself to her. <clears throat> I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've given to us. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would come and Lord, that you would just open up men and women's hearts and let them see the beauty of Jesus, the glory of Jesus, and the love of Jesus in this very moment. And I pray that they would choose wisely with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I don't need to belabor this. I just want you to ask a question. I mean, let, let's just put it this way. When a bride walks down an aisle of a church, she's making a pretty strong statement. She's saying goodbye to about 3.9 billion guys. This is the one and only man I've given my whole life to. If you're in here tonight and you'd say, I haven't done that, I want you to ask yourself first, have you given yourself to Jesus the way a bride gives herself to a groom? Now, don't get me wrong. A bride can make mistakes first week, first year, first 50 years. We're not talking about that. A faithful bride has given her whole heart to her husband. She doesn't flirt with other men. Don't fool yourself. Be honest. If you could see Jesus right now, he's got his arms outstretched. He's got a look of hope on his face because, listen, he gave you a free will and he will never, ever violate your free will. So his look of hope is hoping that you'll say yes to him. He's already given his entire life. He's already died for you, and he's just in great hope right now. That you'll say yes. If you look at the prodigal son, dad, he made the decision, and the dad came running before he even got to the house. Before he ever said a word, the dad came running with gifts. That's how anxious God is to meet you. But you have to decide. You have to do what my wife had to do when I gave her that ring. Am I going to say goodbye to 3.9 billion guys? I'm glad she said yes. I was a hopeful groom. And Jesus is a hopeful groom right now with you. If you're in here tonight and you say, John, truth be told, I really, really haven't given my entire heart and life to him like that. I'm ready to do it right now. I want you to raise your hands. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Just raise them up high all over this place. Oh, my goodness. Put them up high. I've never heard of a bride ashamed of her grin. Never in my life. Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to stand to your feet because no bride's ashamed of her groom. Stand up in, in immediately. If your hand's in the air, stand up. I, wait, I want to give you a few more minutes because there's people still deciding. I'm okay with that. God's not going to force you. I'm not going to force you, but I want to give you a moment. You're counting, the, you're counting the costs. You're saying, oh, all right. Am I ready to say goodbye to the world and the things that put Jesus on that cross and give him my entire heart? If that's you, stand up quickly. Yes, sir, I saw you were worth the wait. You are worth the wait. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I want to make sure. I want to make sure nobody's missed. Anybody else? All right, those of you that are standing, this is what y'all, it's so easy. All you got to do is break up with, with, with those lovers. Break up with them right now. Move out into the aisle. Come all the way down. I want to pray with you. Give them a hand as they come. Come on down. Come on down. Come on. Come on. I want to shake your hand. Come on, man. I'm so proud of you. Come on. I'm so proud of you. Come on. I'm so proud of you. Hey. So proud of you. So proud of you. 
and you, and you. Hey, so proud of you. Come on, give him a hand. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, brother, and you. So proud of you. So proud of you and you. Come on. Come on, come on. There's room down here. Come on down. Come on down. They're still coming. They're still coming. Hey, hey, I just sense somebody is sitting and you want to be standing. Why are you sitting? Just get up and come down right now. I know there's somebody out there. You want to be down here. Come on down right now. That's it. Now look at me. Okay, get rid of the sad looks on your face. It's the greatest decision you've ever made. You've never seen a bride coming down the aisle going, oh. Let me tell you something. Now, if you could get an image of Jesus, let me tell you something. He's got the biggest smile. He's jumping up and down, and he's ready to hug you. I'm serious. That's how much he's excited about what you're doing tonight. Oh, you guys are so far away. Come in if you can. Come on in if you can. Okay, look at me. I'm so proud of you. I am so proud of you. You're going to be a warrior for Jesus. I know it. Lift up your hands. I want you to close your eyes. Why am I closing my eyes and lifting my hands? Outward sign of what you've done inwardly. Now I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to manifest the presence of Jesus. Some of you are going to get a glimpse. I want you to get ready. Matter of fact, I'd like everybody to stand because the presence of God is about to manifest here. It already is happening. <clears throat> There's already people weeping down here. Father, dear Father, He's here. Boy, is He here. Here's His presence right there. right there. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. In Jesus' name, invade this atmosphere. Invade the hearts and manifest the presence of Jesus. Fulfill your word. He's here. Here he is. Can you see his eyes? Some of you are getting a glimpse of his eyes. There's no anger. There's no disgust in those eyes. See how strong they are? But how deep, deep love, the deep love of those eyes. Do you see the smile? It's almost like he's laughing, smiling. Say this out loud to the one you're beholding in your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me for living life my way apart from you. I'm so deeply sorry. This very moment, I walk away from all idolatry and sin. my whole heart I give you my spirit my soul and my body everything I am everything I own I'm yours here's his presence right here wow Jesus thank you I now proclaim you to be my Lord. Say it out loud. I now proclaim you to be my Lord, my King, the one I give my entire allegiance to. 
thank you for welcoming me into your family, to your household. Now fill me with the holy fear of God and the holy love of God. Fill me with your character. I'm yours. There's his presence right there. Right there. Brandy Janita Lost of Rocky Hesevroki Ni Brango Zambrista Vrist Rokoshta Yama Rondest Vricini Dobrongi Sambrende Genevoroshte Batretti Zavrishugra Monzo Rombo Zipre Shanaste Vrabatiste He's here. Okay, there's a healing anointing here right now. Somebody's right hand's being healed. Start moving your right hand and doing what you couldn't do. Somebody's intestines are being healed right now by the presence of God. There's his presence right there, right there, right there. Wow. Now I want you to just thank him in your own words. Thank him. Just say, Master, thank you so very much. Somebody's knees being healed by the power of God right now. Somebody's spine, your back, whatever it is, ner nerves, a pinched nerve in your back. Right now, I'm, I, we command it to be loose. Backs that are curved, we command you to be straightened now. Somebody in here, you're having terrible headaches. You're being healed by the power of God right now. Somebody's uh, right eye is being healed by the power of God. I don't know what's wrong, but your right eye is being healed by the power of God. I command in Jesus' name for sickness, sinus infections to be, to be burned out of these temples. Some of you have had things that just have held you back and held you back, and it seems like it's a chain. It's a lie of the enemy. I want you to lift up your hands right now, and by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the powerful anointing of His Spirit, we free you from generational curses that have gone back from generation to generation to generation. We free you tonight and we declare you to walk in your freedom. Another, another wave of his presence yeah, yeah, yeah. and just thank him come on thank him oh man oh man wow you know it's, it's like the river of God is flowing in here Lord I'm asking that minds would be healed that the synapse connections and the neural connections of the mind would be, Lord, miraculously changed. In Jesus' name, bring healing to people's minds, to their emotions. And Lord, may marriages in here be strengthened and healed. One last time. There's his presence right there. Lift your hands one last time. 
somebody's right wrist and hand, something's really been wrong. And you're being healed by the power of God. And I command that infirmity to go from your right hand and wrist. Yeah. I command it in Jesus' name. There it is. Now start moving it around. There it is. <laughs> Father, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Wow. Thank you, Master. In Jesus' name, let's give him praise. All right, don't, don't, don't lie. Please don't lie in the first thing you do, okay? So don't flatter. How many of you could genuinely sense the presence of God? Put your hands up really high. I'm looking especially down here. I know you all did. Let me see. I think every hand's up. Now, what is that? That's God saying, you're my boy. What's your name? So Christopher, you're now Prince Christopher. You understand your father is the king of the whole universe. You're, you understand, right? Okay, now, let me tell you something. Christopher, you're going to walk out of here and sometime tonight the devil's going to go, nothing really happened. Tell him to shut up in that tone of voice. And you talk to that voice. Don't you listen to it. You got it? You sense the presence of God. Don't you let him lie to you. It was real. How many of you know? Say, I know it was real. How many of you say, hey... I already know in my body I am physically healed. Put up your hand. Put up your hand. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus, thank you. All right. Let me say this. Uh, I preached about three chapters out of the book. The book's got 42 chapters. I made, I said, God, people aren't reading anymore. So the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, write short chapters. So all 40 of the 42 chapters are six pages long. Two of the chapters are eight pages. At the end of every chapter, so it takes you five to seven minutes, if you're a slow reader, seven minutes, to read the chapter. At the end, there's the five Ps. There's the passage, the passage, the main passage of that chapter, the point, the ponder, which I love, things to ponder that day. Then there is the profession and the prayer. I want to say this. It's not a devotional. It is a book. You can read it in one sitting if you want, but I suggest you go through it. Just take it slow. 42 days, that's six weeks. There's six sections of seven chapters. This is the group study or individual study. So there's 30-minute videos that go with this. So we just want to get this into your heart. If, you, if the book table's too slammed or they run out because almost everywhere we're going, they're running out, just go to Amazon because you're all Prime members, okay? I don't care if Bezos gets the money. Let him have it. It's all going to pass away one day. All I care about is you get, the, you get the message, okay? And I know you all are Prime members, so all you have to do is one click. If I send you to my website, you're going to have to fill in your address, your credit card. I know you won't do it, so I'm not going to do it. be better for us if you went, but I don't care. I don't want it. Just get the message so you get this in your heart because I don't want you falling away and disciple people. Get this into other people's lives. Let's see a strong church, amen, in Southern California. I love you. God bless you.